Welcome to the first episode of the Catholic Homebound Podcast. This podcast is meant for, in this time of isolation, uh, to bring community to you, to bring the stories to you that maybe you haven't heard yet, um, not just from our parish that's here at St. John Fisher, but from around the country and around uh, Southern California especially. This first episode is with Father Darren uh, Marilino. He's a Claritian priest, great friend of mine, um, helped me through a lot, supported me even though we lost contact for a while. Um, and it's an amazing podcast, amazing to hear his story, um, not just his uh, how he his conversion story and how he became a priest, but how he's just an awesome person and just how priests are people too. And he's just, he's the epitome of just the cool dude. So thank you, Father Darren, for doing this. And uh, here we go. From this, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, O Lord. Amen. And the Father, Amen. Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So I introduced everybody to you a little bit. I said your name is Father Darren. Uh, you're Claritian yep. priest. Right. Um, yep. But do you want to explain a little bit more about uh, your order and um, how you fell in, how not you fell in, but how you uh, discern the order that you're in now? Sure. So uh, our founder, St. Anthony Mary Claret, his feast day is October 24th. Uh, that was the day he died in 1870. And uh, he founded the Claritian Missionary Priests in 1849 in, in Spain. And uh, his motto was to preach the gospel in urgent, timely, and effective ways. And so being on the media is one of those effective ways to preach, you know, using social media is one of these ways to preach uh, the gospel. So we are servants of the word. And so our goal is to uh, preach the gospel as many different ways as possible. We've had guys work in media. Uh, preaching uh, missions at parishes, working in prison ministry, doing gang ministry, parish ministry, uh, hospital ministry, parish ministry. I mean, I'm trying to think of things we haven't done. Um, yeah, I can't think of any. So, uh, so I went into a religious community back in the late 80s before most of you who are watching this. In fact, almost probably all of you who will be seeing this weren't even thought of back then. And so... I was in my 20s, early 20s, when that happened, when I received my call. But um, the uh, when I went to the religious order, I left there. And so back in 91, I had my spiritual director, who was a Claritian, is still a Claritian. He, for nine months, didn't really push the Claritians. And this one day in late October, early November, he says, hey, you should look. You should look at us. And going, oh, well, tell me about tell me about your Claritians, which shows you what kind of a great spiritual director he was, because he actually was not. Um, pushing his order. He was trying to find God's will, so he brings it up. I applied to the Claritians, and oh, I had a choice to make was either to go to a two-year college or transfer to a Catholic school and probably get one year of college done because I had already gone to the seminary before and had a year and a half of philosophy, so I figured I could transfer to a Catholic university with my philosophy and get out in a year, and that's what happened. So I went to Franciscan University uh, back in 92 and finished up my my college degree, um, and so that was kind of cool. And uh, I I applied to the Claritians, and I joined them in '93, August of '93. And before I I entered the seminary with them, I went to World Youth Day to see Pope John Paul II in Denver, uh, which was really a great experience. And uh, I was not I didn't know too much about Saint Anthony Claret. I just knew that God wanted me to, to be a Claritian. And so the funny part about all that is that way back in October of 93, after I had already joined the Claritians, I, re I read the autobiography of our founder, St. Anthony Mary Claret, which, by the way, is probably one of the best autobiographies I've ever read of a, of a saint. Um, and, you know, obviously St. Teresa Little Flower is a classic, but there's something about if you're really into evangelization and you really want to be creative in your evangelization, St. Anthony Claret's like the man to read. Um, so... I read his autobiography, and then it was then that I was thoroughly convinced that I'm going to be a Claritian, because I just he thought. Well, I should rephrase that. I thought like he did, mm -hmm. since he was older than I am, and so um, I felt at peace the whole time, uh, just turning towards the Claritians. And so that's usually one of the things I tell everybody if they're looking for religious life or priesthood or brotherhood or being a coming of nuns. Like, do you feel at peace in your discernment? And sometimes God calls somebody there for a little while, and then. Asked him to leave because he wants him to have that uh, experience. We don't know why, but God wants people to have that experience. And so, um, I've had religious two religious life experiences. Uh, I did apply to the diocese 
where I was from, and uh, I did not get accepted twice because I tried the first time, and then I joined the, uh, that one religious order, and then I tried again, and they didn't want me, uh, they didn't accept my application. And I thought I was done, and the Lord said, no, you're not done. You're just really upset, which is an understatement. I was pretty upset back in uh, that year in 91. It was a pretty bad year for me emotionally. But a guy got me through that year. Uh, went to Steubenville, the best educational experience I ever had. Uh, had lifelong friends. I've known them for what is it now? 28 years now. Um, got prof I had Dr. Scott Hahn as my professor. I, in fact, he was my professor before he was even a doctor. Um, so that was kind of cool. And then, um, yes, yeah, so that's that's like the Reader Digest of the Reader Digest version of my vocation story. <laughs> um, and you th so, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in a in, in a rural part of Los Angeles called Santa Barbara. <laughs> And what and what kind of what kind of kid were you in high school? Like you you I mean you got to see what kind of kid I was in high school. We knew I knew you from yeah. your teacher. One of not my teacher, but you were a teacher at my high school, and that's where we got to right. know each other uh, first. But what right. kind of what kind of kid were you in high school? So I, in Santa Barbara, that's a quick story. I was in Santa Barbara from the age of three to the age of twelve. My dad died when I was eleven back in December of seventy six, and so when I moved, my mom remar uh, uh, remarried to my stepdad, who also has passed away in two thousand sixteen. But at the time, my stepdad was a really good family, good friend. He happens to be the uh, brother of my uncle, so I had two sisters marrying two brothers. So it wasn't like a, a stranger in the family. So we moved to Huntington Beach, and that's where I did my high school, junior high, and early young adult years before I entered the seminary. So in high school, I was absolutely a goofy, hyper doofus. I was just kind of a goofy, nice kid, didn't get in trouble, never had detention, never was, I don't think I was ever tardy that much. I, I, I don't think I was, I can't remember being tardy uh, at all unless it was for, I, it was never like a habit or anything like that. I, uh, I was at school most of the time. Um, my parents gave me a lot of freedom. Um, I didn't go drinking, didn't do drugs. That wasn't my thing. Uh, didn't whore around. You know, it was just, just, just wasn't really attracted to drugs. Just I, I could drink wine or alcohol if I wanted to at my house, so that was not a big deal for me because we're Italian, so we could have had wine if we wanted to. I tried beer and wine when I was a kid. I was like, ugh, I hated the taste of it, so I wasn't really attracted to it. Um, so in high school, uh, I had no desire to be a priest. Like when I was your age in high school, uh, when, uh, I knew you as a sophomore, I believe. Yes. And uh, and because uh, I started there in 05, and I think you graduated in 07, right? I graduated in 07. No, wait, I started in 04. I, yeah, I, I, didn't, five. I didn't get there. I didn't get there till sophomore year because I transferred from Royals. Prep. So you and I both got there at the same time, then yeah. probably. So uh, uh, I played football my freshman sophomore year, but I was 125 pounds at at five ten. It's really really skinny. I ate like a horse. I couldn't put on weight. If you if I I ate more than most linebackers. If I would, if I had an eating contest with anybody on, on varsity, I would have out eaten them. I was just an amazing eater. But I just couldn't put on weight. I mean, I just had a, a ferocious appetite. So uh, I was a really good kid. I didn't have a lot of friends at the time. I didn't have a lot of church friends until probably after my about May of my sophomore year when I went on my first retreat. And now a lot of those guys that were on my first retreat back in May of nine, of eighty one uh, are my still my best friends or, or, or just my some of my best friends I've had since eighty one. So we're looking at almost uh, what thirty years now? Is that forty years? Almost four, almost forty years next year. Yeah, almost 40 years next year. So, And so we've gone through everything. We've celebrated uh, graduations, birthday parties, 21st birthday parties, weddings, baptisms, uh, all kinds of stuff. So ordinations. Uh, it's really ordinate. Well, yeah, some of them came to ordinations. Um, yeah, some of them, uh, yeah, all of those guys, yeah, I think you're right. All of those, all my closest friends from when I was in high school who whose address I had went to my ordination, so that was really good. Um you know, we used to do a lot of dancing in the uh, in the 80s, and so 80s music was really hot. Like 80, 81, 82, 83, all the you know, there was a place out in Long Beach that was called Infinities. Now I think it's called Roscoe's. It's on Ocean Boulevard, and it used to be a it used to be a dance club, and you had and I'm I'm just saying this because it was true. You had the funk 80s funk music, and then you had the new wave music on another. So basically, it was white floor and a black floor. But I used to go to the uh, to the to the funk side of the, where all the black guys are, and that's how I learned how to do the moonwalk and do all the popping and locking and stuff. And so I really enjoyed being on that side. And you no, know, there was like 
I didn't feel racism. Or I didn't feel us like us against them. It just kind of was, was musical taste. Mm-hmm. And you had, all you had to do was be. I think uh, they had an under eighteen section and over eighteen section. They put a wristband on you. And we just went dancing. Mm-hmm. So it was dancing was really popular in the eighties. Like really, discotheques and uh, clubs were huge, uh, way more than they are now. Um, and so. Uh, we did that a lot, but junior, senior year, junior year was a fantastic year. I just remember really enjoying my, um, uh, my junior year. We went dancing. There's a lot of Christian bands out there, Lifesavers, Undercover, and it was very 80s sounding. And most, you know, people of your generation wouldn't like the music, but for us, it's, it's our high school music, just like you live your high school music. And so, uh, we went, I mean, we were dancing, going, dancing somewhere every, almost every weekend. We were going out. And so my parents were really cool. They said, you know, just let us know where you're going. You got to remember, there was no cell phones. They just wanted to know where we were. And I got to, and I was able to stay up until three in the morning, four in the morning and have a, have a curfew, but all my friends did. So I, I went home when they went home. So there was really no, there was just no way around, um, uh, you know, I I never took advantage of it. I didn't have parties at my parents' house because my parents didn't really uh, leave very often. Mm-hmm. And uh, but you know, I like I said, I wasn't into drinking, and my friends weren't into drinking. We we're all Catholic kids, just kind of being, you know, you can say goody two shoes. But we actually had a lot of fun. We used to do we used to go ice blocking. We used to get a big block of ice, like in those big square solid blocks of ice, and we had this hill which we illegally. Uh, trespassed, and we would uh, take the ice, and we would take a, a cardboard box or a plastic cover, and we would slide down the hill like we we're like in the snow, and we would do that for a while. And then one time, I I remember I get out of there just in time because a friend had to go home, and I kid you not, the 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 police came with a helicopter and started flashing lights on them. We I was leaving when they got those guys got all got caught and told to get rid of their ice. It was pretty funny. That filled the ice in the pool or something like that. But uh, I got out just in time, so I didn't get a ticket or anything like that. But yeah, you, know, you know, we didn't like I said, we were, we were, we just had more fun and rambunctious. We didn't really vandalize, or that wasn't really our thing. TP people's houses. Mm-hmm. Now today it would be a mortal sin because everybody wants toilet paper. But, <laughs> um, but anyways, and and so um, after after so we kind of covered high school to your formation years. Um, you're a big. I could tell you're a big Dodger fan. I know you're a big Dodger fan just from knowing you. But yeah. everyone, everyone who's watching this could tell you're a big Dodger fan. Um, what, <laughs> um, what draws you to the? I mean, you grew up in Huntington Beach, and I mean, what draws you Santa to Santa Barbara? Dodger? Santa Barbara. My grandfather, Grandpa Vito Bruno. Mm-hmm. My Grandpa Vito was a huge Dodger fan. Never went to the games. He was like, uh, he was a very homebody, but he he turned me on to the Dodgers. And I remember I was living in Santa Barbara, so really the closest team was the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. And my very first Major League Baseball game, because I was a Weeblo at the time, we for our sports badge, we went to a Dodger game. It was against the Reds, and I think it was probably in 74 or 75, and uh, the Dodgers lost that game. But I remember seeing my first Major League home run, and I think it was the Reds who hit it. And uh, I hated the Reds because we were supposed to because we were Dodger fans. And, you mm-hmm. know, but, uh, yeah, we, I've been a Dodger fan ever since. I don't hate the Angels. Uh, I won't root for them to beat the Dodgers ever. Mm-hmm. But, uh, uh, I, you know, because Mike Sosha was, you know, was the, the manager there for years and stuff. But, no, I, I, I went to a lot more in, the, in my early years in junior high, high school when I was in Huntington Beach. I went to way more Angel games because it was only a 20-minute drive. Like, who wanted to drive to, uh, to Dodger Stadium? It was like an hour plus traffic. It was just – just too much of a hassle from Huntington mm-hmm. Beach, so we didn't do it that much. What's your What's your most favorite uh, baseball memory? Like growing up through the years and like going to games. Like you're at a game. What's your best memory being at a game? Okay, my favorite live. I see this. I mean, I saw this live. Was and it's one of my bobbleheads. Let me see if I can see it there. Um, let's see if it's there. Shoot. I don't. No, I don't see it there. So uh, I'm at I'm at Manny Ramirez's bobblehead night, and he's not playing. Bases are loaded. They and they pinch hit. They they ask Manny Ramirez to pinch hit, and bases are loaded. And I talk to my friend Mike, and I go, Mike, wouldn't that be cool if he hits a grand slam here? So you know they have they change pitchers. You know he warms up. I kid you not, the first pitch. The guy throws across the plate. Mike uh, Manny Ramirez crushes it into left left field, right over that small little fence, and hits a grand slam. I had never heard Dodger Stadium 
go crazy like that moment. That was my favorite moment of all time at being at Dodger Stadium. And have you ever served? I, th- I think you've told me this, but have you ever served masses for any professional sports teams or anything like that? I did, and you and you are correct. So uh, I on April twenty eighth, two thousand and twelve, was the first time I said mass at Dodger Stadium. And I had this guy named Vin Scully. He was kind of like a sportscaster for the mm-hmm. Dodgers. You might have heard of him. I see his picture. He did my readings. <laughs> yeah, he's over there somewhere. Up there somewhere. Yeah, so Vin Scully did did my readings uh, for me. So could you imagine uh, having the opportunity to have Vin Scully do the readings at Mass for you? That's, that that's, was like one of my highlights. That's so cool. Um, yeah, I remember hearing stories. Uh, I, for, I was at the last uh, prayer breakfast, and the speaker was Sosha. And he was talking. Yes, I was there too. He, he was talking about how him and Lasorda would go to mass together and stuff like that. Yes. I, I think that's really awesome. And you don't hear too much of the professional players that go to mass still. Um, and I, I, I would love to see more like players come out and saying, "Yeah, we we go to mass this day. This priest comes in this day." I heard an awesome homily from this priest. Uh, but I think it's just not something they do. Um, but let's uh, let's transition over to what's going on now with the coronavirus for a little bit um sure. you were a pastor in arizona what is what is your take on a lot of the, what archbishop uh, gomez is doing having today he actually closed down all churches like churches aren't allowed to be open to the public period anymore so what, what is, what's your take on that uh gosh it's so complicated uh, obviously i don't want that to happen mm-hmm. um now, for me, I'd have to figure I would figure if I was working at a parish right now, the most creative thing I would do is two things. One, I would allow uh, confessions like drive drive through confessions. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'd sit on a chair, have the person sit in their car, uh, either with the windows up or the windows down, but be five or six feet away and have them uh, tell their confession, which I did last night. Somebody mm-hmm. called me up and said, hey, Father. He, the guy drove like a, an hour just to go to confession. It's okay. So uh, I see that as, as, a, as a reality that can happen. I also think they should have outdoor adoration, like like going to like a movie theater. You know, you need to park outside and watch the theater and see the screen. They should do the same thing with the Eucharist. They could have outdoor adoration and people can park in their cars and just stand there or sit in there and, you know, uh, and uh, pray that way and have adoration outside. Um, and this way you have the safety of the air and the, and the virus flowing and flying away, but also they're in their cars. Um, and I think the, the most creative, a couple of creative things I've seen here on my Facebook, you'll notice, uh, there was a, a priest smart as a whip. I thought it was, I love priests who are really, who try to think outside the box. He, he got pictures of all of his parishioners. He had them send pictures to him and he printed up the pictures and put them in the pews. So he has all their faces on the pews. And so it's as if he's saying mass to his congregation. Very smart. That was very clever. That, that was very clever. I saw, I think I saw that on your Facebook. That's very clever idea. Um, I've seen and other, the other one is. One other thing too is that this guy, this priest, smart. He took he took the Eucharist and he put it on a truck, and he had the truck drive around his parish boundaries, that's and, had, and had the Eucharist. See, so yeah, that's smart. I mean, that's great. You, you call you, you you do a flock note. You tell your parishioners go outside or drive really slow, and you get you do the sign of the cross. And so you want to bring hope in Jesus to the people since they've been have been forced not to go to him. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. sacramentally speaking. And, and what do you think about people like you do mass every day at noon on your Facebook? I'll, I'll link your Facebook yeah. in our, in our, in our YouTube. Um, but, Thanks. uh, what, what do you take away from doing? I mean, sometimes I see there's 20 people watching. Sometimes there's 40 people watching. What if there's only three or four people watching? What, do, what, what do you take from that? I take that those three or four people are just as important as the 40 to I, on Sunday. I had 800 plus watch the mass. Uh, when I first did it, I had over 600, then I had 400. So the first mass I ever did was pretty high. Sunday was super high, and then now it's been tailing off to about 100 a day during the day. Uh, So I think that um, those people who really, really are desiring and starving for anything spiritual, they're worth it. So. And, and so like, there's a lot of parishes that don't have, uh, the facilities or they don't have this, the technology to like post a live stream mass. My, at my parish, we're very lucky at St. John Fisher that now we're like, we, we were always live streaming Sunday mass for, cause there's a lot of older people in our congregation. So we would live stream our, our Sunday mass, but now we're live streaming daily. Um, what, what, what kind of advice would you give the pastors 
uh, that can't, that don't have the facilities to do such thing, um, what can they do for their congregation? How can they point their congregation in a direction, maybe to go watch someone else's live stream or the Archdiocese live stream? Yeah, I, I would suggest those things, Archdiocese. But also, I'm pretty sure that everyone, I mean, that the pastors have Wi-Fi at their parish. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure that most parishes have Wi-Fi. Yeah. So they could just set up their phone or their iPads, like I'm talking to you right now, mm-hmm. and just do that. I mean, that's all you have to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, in fact, my masses is from are coming from my cell phone. I'm doing my. I think I'm doing my Instagram on my cell phone, and I'm doing uh, my Facebook on my iPad, and that's all I'm doing. I mean, I think everybody can do that. Okay. Um. I, so uh, there's a funny story about a priest that was trying to set up his mass. I don't know if I saw it. On, maybe I saw it on your Facebook. He was trying to set up mass, but he didn't know what he was really doing and accidentally put on filters uh, while he was doing his <laughs> Facebook live. So when he got into frame, he had a, like this, this animated helmet on. It was, it was, oh rude. My and, he, and he couldn't see. He just did the whole mass like that. It was really funny. That is hilarious. <laughs> if I he find- probably was a boom. He probably was a boomer like me. Yeah. But I mean, you're really good with technology. Uh, explain, like, explain. Not that what... good. Actually, um, I'm like, uh, I'm like Bishop Barron. I know that it exists. I want to use it, but I, I, because I've been a priest for 20 years, I've really lost. I used to be super savvy, but now I know that I can use this stuff. But I'm still trying to learn the technology. My my learning curve is a little low. But you bring up, you bring people around you that know how to do it, like for your podcast and stuff yes. like that. Right. And so, like, explain, right. saying, explain your podcast uh, to everybody. Like, what what do you do on your podcast? And like, what kind of guests have you had on your podcast? Uh, I haven't done any. I I, I have a TV show that I'm producing. That's it's right. Called Sorry. The Hound of Heaven. And so the pod, I, we do want to make that a dual podcast as well. So we mm-hmm. want to use the audio from these uh, interviews. So uh, the the interview show is called The Hound of Heaven, which comes from the Francis Thompson poem called The Hound of Heaven, which he wrote in 1893. And it's basically a poem of his autobiography of him being a prodigal son and coming back to the church. He's Catholic. He was Catholic. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was a seminarian, got kicked out, became a drug addict, lived on the streets, used to whore around. A prostitute brought him in, brought him back to health. Uh, it was a very platonic relationship. And then he went to a monastery and wrote the greatest poem in the history of mankind called The Hound of Heaven and how God is the one who pursues us to bring us back to the faith. And so uh, I, heard, I learned about, um, uh, what's his name, Steven Spielberg's uh, foundation that he started called the Shoah Project where he interviewed all the, the Holocaust survivors uh, and hear their stories, about 55,000 of them. And so I thought, you know, it would be kind of cool if we had a Catholic version of that. And so... Um, and so I came up with the idea about mm, about 10 years ago of interviewing famous Catholic personalities. And so uh, it finally came into reality a year ago, April last year. Uh, I was able to interview the two directors and screenwriters of the movie Unplanned. And uh, that was my premiere episode. So when you go to Catholic CatholicMediaMissionaries.com, CatholicMediaMissionaries.com, you will see the, the, the premiere slash, uh, they call it a proof of concept. Mm-hmm. And so that's our premiere episode. And then I interviewed a hockey player uh, named Joseph DePinto, played with the, with the Anaheim Ducks back in 2007 when the Stanley Cup. I got to wear a Stanley Cup ring. It was really kind of cool. And then uh, Bruno, Sir Bruno Serrato lives in Anaheim, and he is uh, owns the White House, Anaheim White House restaurant. It's an Italian restaurant. And he feeds over 4,000 kids a day with pasta. So those are my first three. And so I, I felt that that – that I wanted to have men as role models to um, to uh, to inspire people. Mm-hmm. This is my what age group to be better Catholics, to be better Christians, and just to be better people. And so I have a list of about eighty guys that are on my list. Of course, you know Vince Scully's and the Tommy Lasorda's. Uh, something's pounding. I'm not sure what that is. Make sure it's like your, there. We go. Is, is that your finger? No. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. All right. Just want to make sure it's not on the audio. And so uh, that TV show is called The Hound of Heaven, and we're hoping to uh, shoot either th- uh, six more. Of course, we were in, we were in total uh, production mode, and the coronavirus just shut us down. So uh, we hope to you know get things started up again. However, after you know, so my director Joseph Cinemato, uh he's a vetted producer for a streaming company called Netflix. You might have heard of it. <laughs> and so. Um, 
are, we have a very strong possibility of getting that show on Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime. So if it does happen, it would be the first time that I know of that if a Catholic, a Catholic priest produces a show for Netflix. So mm -hmm. that would open up a lot more doors for us to do a lot more projects, movies, TV series, and so forth. So that's our goal. It looks very promising. And, and is it more, it's a, it's a, sit, it's kind of like this, a sit down conversation, uh, just between you and the person, or is it, do you guys yes. go into the backstory with some B roll and stuff like that? Or I, I would say that if you watch David Letterman's uh, show, my next guest is, mm -hmm. uh, he actually has a very interesting co uh, conversation. So it's kind of like, we, we would like to do, uh, that we like to have a, uh, on camera face-to-face -face, interview style sit down and then we like to do b-roll where we're going to the person's house or you know hitting the home run or hit, scoring a goal or whatever it ends up being if I get the Vince Scullys and the Tommy Lasorda types and the Mark Wahlbergs and and uh, Kevin James those type of guys um, uh, David Henry I believe is kind of like a, 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 he's a, a millennial famous kid from a Disney Channel show mm -hmm. back in the day, um, Mario Lopez and stuff like that, those kind of guys mm -hmm. who, you know, you know, whatever it is, however the conversation goes, what you have to do is you have to do the interview first. And then when you, when you're done with the interview, then you know what type of pictures you need from, for your B roll and the video you might need afterwards and so forth. So, um, I have a really, uh, Joseph, just so you know, Joseph Cinemato, you'll see on my website, I uh, he's worked in secular, um, uh, video production for years. He's won 10 tellies, which is the equivalent of an Emmy, but for television commercials. So mm. he's established in, in the world of uh, media. So he knows production very well. Uh, I'm, I'm more of the creative type. I don't really, I mean, I probably would have been his type of a person 25 years ago and learning how to do it. But what I learned and is totally different now that the, the, the technology has completely changed. So I'm absolutely obsolete. So yeah, and and you mentioned like how technology has changed for the past, even if you take the last five years, how crazy or yes ten, or ten years, like even when I was in high school twelve year twelve years ago, it was uh, it, I didn't have it. There was no smartphones back then. The iPhone, the I, the mm -hmm. first iPhone came, I think in two thousand nine. That sounds about right. I think the first iPhone came in two thousand nine. So that was like one of the first smartphones. Uh, the, there's the BlackBerry before that, and the Palm Pilot, but those were those right. never really took off. The the it was never really that great of a format of, of a right. user interface. But if you were to be raised now, say you're a senior in high school now, and do you think you would have still gone to the priesthood with all this kind of technology around you? That's uh, almost, I don't know. I really don't know. I think, I think, I think if, if male and females actually give God a chance to uh, and say, ask God, what is your will for me? So when I was teaching at Mary Star, I was teaching the seniors for that one year back in 05. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the spring of 05, I can't remember if Pope uh, Benedict had been elected or not, because I remember John Paul II died in 05 April. So mm -hmm. I can't remember if I had asked a question before or after that. And so I asked all my, all my seniors, who here has asked God what they should do with their lives, you know, where they should go, what kind of school, what their major should be? You raise your hand. I had, over, I had over 100 students, not one raised their hand. I said, hmm. So I ended up telling all my freshmen that, hopefully, and most of them probably don't remember me asking that question, but uh, for all your kids out there, uh, it's kind of amazing because I didn't either, I didn't ask God either. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really, no one told me to think about asking God, hey, God, what do you want me to do? I just kind of went with my, all right, let's do this because I went to video school after uh, junior college and stuff. But that's a good question to ask. You know, what is God's will for you? Uh, even if you do go to the seminary or the convent for a couple of years and you leave, it's so what? It's just you, you still God wants you to do that for a reason. But you really have to ask the question, what is God's will for my life? And I really like. I thought it was a really. This is a line that I learned when I was in high school or junior or junior college. I can't remember. But a friend of mine had once said that we all. Everybody should discern the priesthood of religious life. Everybody. And pursue it. And let God open or close that door. Because God will open and close the door if it's his will for you or not. And I thought it was really smart. I think it's really wise. So if you say, okay, look, I'm called to be a priest. I'm called to be a nun or a brother. Let's go. Come on, God. Let's make it happen. And God goes, mm, nope, sorry. You're mm -hmm. not called. Or, yeah, you are called. It's good that you asked the question because you weren't asking before. Yeah. Uh, and you said you were denied twice by your, your local diocese. Was that Diocese of Orange? Uh, yes. Okay. So you're denied. You know, it, oh, sorry. Were I mean, you, I, oh, God. 
You're talking no, I was going to say the reason I think the reason why God wanted me not to go to the diocesan way route was because I'm not really diocesan. I'm not really parish priest material. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't find joy in that. I can do it. I love people and I love being at the like talking to people at parishes, but it's just. I, my brain is just too creative, and, and when you live in a parish in a, in a bureaucracy and slow, and just my, when you're too creative and you get stifled, you can't really use your creativity at a parish. You really can't. Mm-hmm. So. And you know priests from both diocese, dios, uh, diocese of Orange and diocese of LA. Um, what what thing in like I I think about this a lot. Like, what does the diocese of LA? What are they focusing on that they shouldn't be focusing on, and what do they need to focus on more? You know, I really don't. I'm trying to learn LA again because I had been out of LA for, gosh, for well, now it's gonna be um, eight years. So mm-hmm. I can tell you how Phoenix was, but mm-hmm. I don't know what the, the mission is here at uh, at um, Los Angeles. Okay. But I let's take the so let's, I, let's take the U.S. as a whole, the US, whole USCCB, like the whole um, gotcha. USCCB. What what do you think? There's there's a lot of things I feel like um, they focus too much on. And if, um, Give me one thing, and I'll tell you if you're right. Well, I mean, I feel like they 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 lose focus on evangelization so much because that people are already there and people are just going through the checklist. And I feel like they're not they're not focusing enough on evangelization, or, or not focusing enough on new media like what you're doing with the Claritians <clears throat> and what I I mean what Bishop Barron does, which is great. I mean, he's he's a dio- uh, part of the LA Archdiocese, but he's one of few that really focus on new media and i feel like new right. media is the, the the way we we can meet these kids yeah so um i really think that uh for us to really reach fallen away catholics in catholics uh they say the average age now of a kid leaving the faith is 13 so okay so let's go to the 13 year old why would, how can a 13 year old even make that decision? I was 13 and stupid. I don't I, My parents just said, go to mass. I went to mass. So why? I think your fingers are doing it again. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so uh, I think once you have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, then everything else seems to follow. And I think what happens in the Catholic church is we focus too much on catechesis, like education, and they don't focus on first having people have a conversion experience with Jesus Christ, and then you catechize. And that's how St. Saint, Saint Peter started the Catholic Church on Pentecost Sunday. He comes out, the Holy, the Holy Spirit hits the, uh, hits the church. He goes out and preaches what we call the charismatic message, that this is who Jesus is, he's the solution, and he's being introduced, and that's called the charismatic message. And so I think once you have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, then you're going to want to know him more and love him more and serve him more. So you're being introduced to him. Hey, you know, hi, I'm Father Darren. This is Jesus Christ. Nice to meet you. Okay, I've been introduced to him. I want to know more about you. Let's have a conversation. And so that's what prayer is, the conversation with uh, Jesus. Mm-hmm. And the nice thing is you can have that conversation anytime, anywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. So you can you can have a mental talk anywhere you want. So I think until the church has an abundant source of evangelization retreats or encounters, like the the Crescio or the Light of the World uh, for adults, and they even have Light of the World for high school. They have uh, they have Crescio, I don't they have Kairos and all those kind of things. Until kids actually have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, uh, we're going to be spinning our wheels. We're going to be saying, "Why aren't they coming to church?" Yeah, well, because you're asking them to learn. You're asking them to have a relationship and know somebody they don't really care about. Mm. Like you know, you really should learn a lot about Putin. Well. I have no desire to learn about Putin. But let's say I, I have dinner with the guy, and I find out he's actually a charming personality. I actually like learning about him. We know that he's he, he's, a, he's not a great leader, uh, but I'm using it as an example that you know there are some uh, people that, uh, let's say, uh, everybody wants to meet the Pope, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, pope Francis, any Pope, even Pope Benedict, I'd love to meet that guy. This, this, one of the smartest Popes ever. And mm-hmm. John Paul number two. I mean, these guys were like neck and neck. So... If you're not focusing on encounters with Jesus Christ, you're just wasting your time. So they say that 6% of your parishioners are engaged Catholics, so that 93% of your parishioners who are going to church are not engaged. Can you? So you have 70 million Catholics who are baptized in this country, mm-hmm. and you only have 6% of them who are actually going to church every Sunday and engaged. What do I mean by engaged? They, they study the faith. They pray. 
They, uh, they evangelize and he's reaching out to people and then they're generous with their time and money and talent. Mm -hmm. So those, that's the, that's the criteria for an engaged Catholic. Mm -hmm. So 93, God, that's a lot of people to reach out to. You, you be, I like to tell everybody, you're going to be busy for the rest of your lives. But, you know, the Catholic Church refuses, and there's a lot of pastors out there who just don't have enough humility to say, you know what? What I'm doing ain't working. Mm -hmm. What I'm, I'm feeding my five percenters? Okay, you could do that easily. And five percenters, I always call them the five percenters. So, hey, you can feed your five percenters, but... Okay, great. It makes you look good. I, I got I got twenty people going to a Bible study when you should be having hundreds. Mm -hmm. And so, why is that not happening? Yeah, and, and that's a big thing. Like when I first came to this program, there's a hundred kids in each year, and so like I'm I'm expecting big numbers because I'm, I I started the 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 life team program here from scratch. Uh, they haven't had a youth ministry program like a consistent youth ministry program here in about seven eight years. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna get ready for a hundred kids. If there's two hundred kids in year one and year two combined, I'm gonna have a uh, hundred kids. I had I had thirty five, which I mean, it, to me, I was let down a little bit. Um, until I took a step back and realized, well, these 35 are just like you said, like about the whole live stream, like these 35, these eight, these 10, whoever show up, they're important. And I gotta, I gotta give them my hundred percent. And, right. um, and I saw today, like the, we locked the church today and I'm, I'm still working at, I'm still working at, uh, St. John Fisher. And so like, I'm one of the only people here at the office and I see people walk to the church doors, read the sign and their head just drops. So what kind of advice and what kind of uh, encouragement could you give to those people that are seeking the church but can't get in right now? Yeah, that's where uh, the pastors and everybody, they're going to have to have, like I said, outdoor adoration. Um, no, I'm talking about even, not, not, for the, not for the parish itself, but for the people who are seeking it. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is that um, – because uh, it's the, 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 the for the parishioner to seek it, they got to have a thing to seek, and so um, that's where the the priests and the pastors. You know, you can even have a Q and A. I mean, you could probably I could probably turn on my my uh, Facebook Live and my uh, what you call it and my Instagram Live, and uh, start having people ask me questions and just do a Q and A. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I got allergies driving me crazy. Yeah, don't worry, worry. I wash my hands. <laughs> um. So let's get into about your faith and your Catholic, your Catholicism. Um, right. What is your favorite? Like, what is your favorite sacrament to give? And then we'll go. We'll ask after that. We'll go re to receive. Oh gosh, that's not even fair. Um, oof. baptism. Mm -hmm. On adults or ch our babies? Yes. Which 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 one do which one gives you more fulfillment? I mean, they might give you the equal amount, but what, what does does one give you more fulfillment than the other? There are times where I've got to baptize somebody really late in life, and then they die relatively later. Like I, this one guy died two years later. Uh, he was supposed to die in six months. He ended up living like three years. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a huge joy. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a true story though. This was a teenager. Uh, it was I want to say it was the I want to say it was six years ago. Um, I was the first Sunday of Lent. Get a phone call. Hey, um, this kid. It was in the afternoon. This kid. No, it was in the evening. No, it was the afternoon. Yeah. So the afternoon. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I get a call. Uh, emergency. This kid needs anointing because he's dead. I go, well, we don't anoint bodies. I'm thinking to myself, well, we really don't anoint. But this this, this um, chaplain goes, he's dead, and the family wants to go over there and bless the body. And I said, okay. So I'm thinking, okay, he's dead. I'll just go over there and bless the body and help the family out, right? So I go to the hospital, and I was in Prescott. It was nice because it's only like a two- or three-minute drive, so I drive over to the hospital. I walk into the room, and I hear this. Beep, 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 beep. Beep, beep. I go, wait a minute. This guy ain't dead. He's alive. Mm -hmm. I go, how did that happen? So this 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 non-Catholic chaplain gave me completely the wrong information. And I'm going, this is not. And so I go, I walk in, and I'm looking around, and I'm, I'm noticing that, okay, there is nobody in this room 
it was Catholic. And when I mean they were, you know, cowboy, hick, Protestant, down south looking guys, that's exactly what it looked like. So they, when I walked in this room, I, they did not look like Catholics. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you that I was right in a few minutes. So I, I walk in there and go, so I look in there, I said, uh, yeah, I was asked to give anointing. I didn't tell the people that I was told that he was dead because mm -hmm. I didn't want to say that because I didn't want them to know the chaplain gave me wrong information. So I said, well, can I uh, anoint him? And they said, sure. So I anointed him. And uh, and I'm going, gosh, how in the purgatory did I get called into this room? How do they know to call a Catholic priest? There's, not, there's no way there's a Catholic in this room. There is no way snowball chance in purgatory. And then I see her, Grandma, Abuelita, <laughs> the only Mexican in the whole room. I go, ah, that's who called me. Mm. So I walk outside, and, and, I, and I was acting very nonchalant, and I said, so uh, did you call me in? She goes, oh, yes, Father. I just didn't know what to do because, you know, nobody here is Catholic. And I go, ah, see, Father knows how to smell this stuff. I don't know. I have a sixth sense or something. My spidey senses were working. Something was not right. I said, I go, I go, was he ever baptized? And this Mexican grandmother goes, I don't know. Let's ask the other grandmother. And she, she was... You know, a 70-year-old woman who had tattoos on her face and a teardrop on her eye. Like, so she goes, well, I don't know. Let's ask the mother. So can you, could you ask the mother to come out? So we asked the mother to come out. And I said, my, I'm so sorry for what's going on. I said, I have a quick question for you. Uh, is, is your son, um, is he ever baptized? And, she, and the mother said, hmm, I don't know. Let's ask the father. I go, okay, <laughs> he's not baptized. Because <laughs> the mother doesn't know. Nobody knows, right? Mm -hmm. So mothers know everything. So I, of course, the father comes out. I'm just, I'm, I know for a fact that I'm going to have to baptize this kid. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I asked the parents, I said, hey, can I have the honor of baptizing your son? And they said, sure, no problem. And I said, okay, great. And so I, 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 I um, and I asked, and now here's my proof that they were, they were, they were not really into Christianity. I said, what name would you like to give your son for his baptism? And she says, John, is that a Christian name? Will that work? <laughs> and I go, yes. And I, you know, I, and I realized that I was, I confirmed my thoughts. I go, yes, it's actually a really good name. John's one of the writers of the Gospels. That's a really good choice. And so what I'm going to do is after I baptize him, I want to send you a, uh, a baptismal certificate for your son. So can, can I have both your addresses? Because his parents were not married. They were apparently, either they were at one time or they weren't. I don't know. I didn't ask. I just know they weren't living in the same address. So I got both their addresses. And so I baptized him in the name of John. So I had to get, I had to use his elbow over a dish because if you, if you pour water uh, on the flesh and it pours like this, it's called washing. And so he's, I was washing original sin. So I, I didn't, so I baptized him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ended up doing the opposite. I ended up doing last rites first and then <laughs> baptizing. But the last rites didn't really stick or maybe they did. Who knows? We don't know for sure. Maybe they did or didn't. So when I baptized him, I found out later that he died two days later. Oh, really? He was 18. 18 years old. Mm. He was riding his bike. He fell off his bike, hit his head on a rock. Wow. So, how about? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a tough story. What 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 is your favorite to receive? Confession. Confession. Yeah. Now I receive the Eucharist. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I love saying Mass every yeah. day. That's just. But to receive, I love confession. I love going to confession and just feeling, you know, just feel like ah, oh, forgiven. Yeah. You know. I should go every week, but it's harder for me because I'm not at a parish anymore. I used to go every week because I, I used to, on my day off, go to a, a priest rectory and I can go once a week. But it's a little harder now since I don't have that. So, so you did, it, did, did yeah. it, did it, did <laughs> it. I don't know why that's even, there's no sports going on. I don't know why that's popping up. Yeah. But yeah, um, really. what's, uh, being at the San Gabriel Mission, you can't go to, you won't go to confession there? Uh, oh, I do. I, I go there quite a bit. When I'm see the thing is, I'm 20 minutes away, so it's oh. got to be when I'm over there. That's out of town. It's okay. almost like you're you're what you're Palos Verdes or where do you live? I live in San Pedro, but I work in Palos Verdes. Yeah, so it's almost like you're living in San Pedro, and you're like you have to go to Long Beach for confession. It's mm. like okay, I can get there, but it's not on the way. It's out of the way. So 
So like I have a thing. I don't I don't go to confession with anyone I I I, I work with or have worked with. And so like two of the the two of the main two of the priests that are at Holy Trinity now uh, were also at uh, they worked with me at my last parish at at in uh, Glendale. And so, like, okay. I have to, I have to go. I go to uh, either Saint Philomena or uh, Saint Margaret Mary for confession. But right now, it's kind of tough. So, but I'm trying. Yeah, so I have to call my priest friends to. I have to hit them up. Be like, hey, can I? Can you do confession in a little bit? I'll, I'll drive to Culver City to come meet you out there. Wow, <laughs> that's a check of a drive. So let me give you an idea. So like, just so I had a policy as pastor, never to hear anybody's confession face to face. Mm. If you're my employee, I don't want it. I don't want you to go to confession to me. Mm-hmm. Of course, some people would break that directive when they walked in. It's like, you can't kick him out. But I just, you know, try to tell him, well, don't, you know, I, I would never say don't come to me. I would just say sometimes I would recognize an employee's voice, but it would be behind the screen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, but I never, ever in my life have ever said, hey, Zach, what are you doing behind the screen? You know, mm-hmm. I, I, if I recognize a voice, I would never acknowledge that I knew their voice because I don't want them to ever not want to come back to confession. Yeah. Um, now, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead. But some priests do that in jest, but I won't do that. Okay. Um, I want to – so I've told a lot of the teens my story about how when I was a junior in high school, I got hurt playing football, yeah. and I yeah. got – carted away to ambulance it was my first game my cousins came to and it was in orange county and uh i couldn't feel anything below the chest down and um you came and i thought you yes. were, i couldn't really hear much my belt i had I, I rung my bell pretty good so i couldn't really hear anything and uh you came in and uh i want to i want i want them to hear the story the rest of the story from your point of view Okay, so uh, I see Zach on the field, and you're—I don't know—you're probably about midfieldish, mm-hmm. and um, and I remember f- at that time Father Anthony comes up to me and goes, "Hey, uh, go follow the ambulance, like a uh, like a personal injury lawyer, <laughs> and you know find out where they're going." So we fi- I follow you to the—I don't know—I couldn't tell you which hospital it was because I don't remember. I don't. But know I follow either. the ambulance, and so I go to the, I go to the I go to the hospital and. Uh, and I always carry my, my oils in my car because I think I drove my car there because it was not it was an away game for us. It was that Valley and Christian, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. Valley Christian I don't think is in Orange County though. I think they're in LA somewhere. No, they're they're Orange think, County, so they're they're uh, right past Huntington Beach, almost to Costa Mesa. Was it that far out there? Yeah. Okay, maybe it was. Yeah. Okay. Well, you probably remember that better than I would. So, anyways. I, I, I remember I brought my, my, my stole with me, my oils and my prayer book, and I'm, you know, I'm just walking in there nonchalant knowing that I'm just going to anoint Zach and just you know, make, you know, and I, and I see your, and I actually see your body language, and you looked really scared, like your face looked scared, and I go, oh, crap. I go, I think he thinks that I'm giving him last rites. And my mind just said he's thinking. He's, my mind says to me that Zach thinks he's getting last rites and that he's dying. That's what I'm thinking in my head right now. Like I can tell by your body language. I go, and that's what made, prompted me to say, go, Zach, I'm not giving you last rites here. I'm just giving you anointing of the sick. You're not dying. And I remember your whole body language went, oh, like your whole demeanor just, oh, I'm not dying because the priest told me I'm not dying. That's, what, that's what, how I got out of it, right? Mm-hmm. And I said, wow, why the Holy Spirit? told me to say that to you. It was clear that the Holy Spirit goes, Zach is just not taking this well. He thinks he's going to die. And I was told by the Holy Spirit that I need to tell you that. And I just remember your, I never, and I tell that story too. I tell the story from my perspective, what I saw mm-hmm. about people who should get, get confession and absolution and last rites and the anointing of the sick and all that stuff and why that's, and so I always use your story as one of those great stories that I have. And then I also tell that one I told about the kid who got baptized and mm-hmm. anointed and stuff. And so, yeah, from, so all your kids out there, uh, yeah, it, it's, it was, a, it was the Holy Spirit literally told me to, to say that to, to your, to your fearless leader, Zach, because I think as Zach will tell you, he, that's exactly what was going through your head, right? Yeah. I, I didn't but think I was going to yeah. die. I thought I was going to be paralyzed. And that's, that was like the scariest thing to me. Like I thought I wasn't going to have use of my legs yeah. anymore. Um, yeah. cause it, I mean, it was, it was, it was just a crazy event, uh, a series of events that happened. And uh, when he told me that I was like, yeah, I, I finally was relaxed. It's just, it's just like the first time I went to adoration. I, I, I truly, that was like, it was like when I truly felt like presence, like the anointing right. of the sick gave me that like confidence just to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right. here. I'm with it. So, yeah. um, 
I want to thank you, Father Darren, for doing this. You're the first episode of the Catholic Homebound podcast, and I want to thank yeah. you. For, I want to thank you for being here and, and supporting me. Uh, like you always, you always supported me, even after we lost touch for a while. You've always been a great support to me. I want to thank you for everything you've done. Hey, you're welcome. My pleasure. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to end the podcast right now, and then yeah. And this was the first episode. Thank you. I want to thank Father Darren again. Um, he's an amazing man, amazing story. Um, we'll bring it back on the podcast again uh, next week. Uh, we'll have another podcast from someone else um, working on the details. But I want to thank you for taking the time to listen, and I hope you have a blessed week. And in this time of isolation, know that you're not alone. Christ is always with you, and we're here for you here at St. John Fisher. I'm here for you if you ever need anything. Feel free to reach out. Thank you, and God bless.